In the clash of the three German premium manufacturers, Audi, BMW and Mercedes, Mercedes is clearly leading in global sales at the moment. Now Audi wants to fight back with the all-new generation of the Audi A6, the big luxury sedan. Can it be best in segment? That was the question you've asked me. And we will of course experience that together. For the exterior, which is the unique setting for this vehicle, how is it different to the A7 and the A8? Interior, what have they done there, also technology-wise, infotainment-wise, if you compare it to the competitors, also with a night driving special there, and of course the driving experience, how does it master the compromise between sportiness and luxury? On Autogefuel, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars, with Thomas in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! In the front we can see an evolution of the design, so it's not super different than the predecessor version and it also has similarities with the A7 and the A8. Overall the A7 has this rather sporty approach, the A8 the very classic one with the luxury orientation and this one here is somewhat in between. It is also the S line we have here today for you with a black single frame grille, really large. We have those sensors here in the front where they can still keep the 3D out logo I like that because sometimes those logos are replaced nowadays have 2D logos sensor be behind that here they have the sensor on the side overall 38 assistance systems available overall we will talk about them very soon also in the lower part a stronger bumper with the S line those headlights come standard with LED however those ones here are the optional matrix LED light with spectacular functions and we did caught some night shots this time so very soon in a special um, special clip will also show you how it was driving at night and with a pretty spectacular effect I can tell you. 4 meters 93 or 16 foot 2 is the total length of the all-new Audi A6 so the exterior dimensions haven't really changed that much. The rim style starts with 17 inch optional 21 inch maximum those ones here 20 inch so um, yeah they're already quite huge they are okay in the riding comfort i can already tell you right now soon more to that in the driving part s-line badge right there also with a sportier bumper then the color by the way what would you say is it white or is it gray it is called suzuka gray but it's somehow also white depending also on the camera shot um, it's something in between then the very classic sedan shape you know this will also be available as an a6 estate or Avant as we say in Germany is when you want to have you know more versatility. Then what is Audi doing design wise? You can see here a dropping line on the height of the door handle dividing in light and shadow and it's been picked up here by a second design line to form a little stronger shoulder. Overall they use sharp design lines whereas Mercedes more goes for those round central lines. This is definitely a matter of taste. Do you like this one more than the E-Class? Tell me in the comments. And to the rear here again more sharper design lines leading up to those taillights. And let me tell you something about suspensions already right here because it all, always fits to the side profile here. We have four different suspensions. Base sport suspension 20 millimeters lower, adaptive sport suspension and the air suspension which is top trim and also built in this very vehicle. It is worth the extra price if you have the money Otherwise, the base trim will also do just fine if you want to more go for a fleet budget solution. And now to the rear part here. It's a designer that's very horizontally oriented with those new taillights that stress the width of the vehicle. 55, by the way, is the batch here for the 3 liter 
engine and they have this no nomenclature which I do not agree with because 55 is telling me nothing basically about the vehicle. It's just a fantasy figure but they have this you know this strategy that they have basically a stair strategy and then different horsepower figures stand for different numbers and again they don't make any sense. In the lower part they have this fake exhaust design and this is just I mean they could just also have saved that. Um, it also looks a little bit strange in the S line if you drive behind the car uh, and have those layers here it looks really squarish a um, little bit you know like a, like, a, um, like a hovercraft or something like that. So I think a very evolutionary design but in the rear they actually played around a little bit and also interesting if you compare the A7 and the A8 this one here the A6 goes really straight whereas the A8 goes a little bit inward like this in the yard design or boat design and the A7 goes a little bit like this from a more sporty approach. Engines. This one here is the 3 liter TFSI turbo petrol engine with 340 horsepower. The overdrive distribution is always 40% in the front and 60% in the rear. This is the basic distribution, then it can vary a little bit depending on the situations. This one will be the main petrol engine. All of the petrol engines will soon also be equipped then with those particle filters. And the same goes for the TDIs, of course, for the diesel side. You start with a 2 liter TDI, this one then has front wheel drive and only a 12 volt board net. All others, the V60 for the petrol and also the 3 liter TDIs, they come with a 48 volt board net, so more electrification, mild hybrid system that you can use this sailing or coasting function to sail, save some fuel and that of, of course also all the assistance systems can be powered. And about, about the horsepower figures then for the diesels, the 2 liter TDI will be with about 200 horsepower and the 3 liter TDI with 231 or 286 horsepower. And the last one, the 286 horsepower, will be the, the only one coming with the converter automatic gearbox or the other with the S-Tronic dual clutch transmission. One short preview of night driving before we start with the really driving part because this is really so fancy, so cool. Look at how this car looks like when you drive it at night. Very well done with the um, illumination, with the ambient light. You can pick a lot of different colors for that um, as well. Then we have, for example, also the head-up display, which you can very well see at night. It can display different information. Also, those arrows, for example, where you have to go in the route. And also very spectacular, the uh, night vision feature, again an option um, that might be useful when you're really living somewhere where you don't have any exterior lighting available and you're driving a lot of time at night. And my favorite feature is definitely, definitely those, uh, you know, those matrix LED headlights. You know, this car always came with LED, but matrix LED with the high beam function, this is then optional and you can see the spectacular effect when you're somewhere driving with light or maybe there's a car in front of you then this spot is left out so not all of those single leds are being activated but then when you come to a darker area bam here it is and then it it widens the the light view and you really think you are in a spaceship and everything is getting bright again. So and of all the system tries to prevent anyone from getting blinded, but you should have the optimal, optimum view. And I have to say, I think I hardly ever had a nighttime ride where I could see so much. So, you know, when you're living in a crowded area where also motorways may be illuminated and you're not driving so many times at night, save the money, stick with the standard LED, but if you're really a nighttime driver, you, that often happens to you, or maybe in a Nordic country where it's often pretty dark, then those matrix LED lights will really help you. Also, you know, one of the technology highlights here for sure.
this is the vehicle key. I think it also has a premium approach. But you can also use the key this entry function. Just put your hand right here to close the vehicle or put it inside the door handles to open it. And this one here is also equipped with the optional soft close. Magic. But you have to pay for it extra. Then inside here extreme clean design, great build quality here with brushed aluminum style. You can also have just a black style here for example, so different choices. Alcantara at the inside of the doors, then galvanized buttons with a clicking sound. Click, click. So that's always fun. Every single button. Not so much room here for bigger bottles, just small bottles right there. Then the main part of the interior. At the moment you can see all the infotainment system monitors are shut off. I will soon show you how they look like turned on, but in this way you can see how it's you know in the most clean sur surrounding with the S-Line package also inside, flat bottom of the steering wheel is a very sporty approach. Single frame grille is mirrored on the inside of the steering wheel. I like when interior deals are picked up basically then from exterior ones. And those seats, it's the same then with the suspensions here with the seats because you have four different types. Base seats, sport seats, sports plus seats and both sports and sports plus are available here with this Alcantara frequency it's, it's called. On the outside they partly use leather red, partly real leather um, but it's already a step forward in the higher trims. And then the optional one is a multi-contour seat. I showed you that in a static setup. So four seats available. And with those sport seats, you're really fine off because you have more shoulder support right here. And they are also available then with Alcantara. But you can also go with base seats just with fabric, at least in Germany. Sitting inside, it is very spacious and that's also a difference for example to the A7 which we have also tested. The A7 is a little bit flatter especially here in the A pillar and this one here gives you more headroom especially if you don't have the panoramic roof equipped you have plenty of headroom although I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. You can also adjust the steering wheel in wow it's like <laughs> uh, I think I've never seen a steering wheel where, where you can adjust it really in this distance is really interesting. Um, those seats here, they have a manual control. You can put the front part of the seat a little bit higher if you like. You can make it a little bit longer. You can pump it up, y'all. I guess they've put the manual seat here that I can pump it up, y'all, for, for you, just, you know. And then this um, control knob to control the rear part of the seat, which is really hard to control and you're always damaging your watches. So um, I don't like this system. I think for a car of this price, every single seat from the base model should have the electric control. On the one hand, I'm fine when nothing is really, you know, not everything is electronically controlled, but seat-wise, it's also a safety feature when you're, for example, driving and think, oh, I need, you know, to change the angle in the rear and then you just blip, blip, and then it's done. So I think it's really easier than the manual control here. Other than that, you have this typical luxury sedan seating position in the front. And the feeling that the interior gives you already here from the first seating test is that BMW and Mercedes feels a little bit more voluminous in the interior, where this one here is sleeker, cleaner. This is, however, nothing with just good or bad. It is indeed a personal preference, so you should also compare our other videos then from the 5 Series and the Mercedes E-Class. This is the interior overview and definitely a wow effect. You know, I'm not too happy with the shiny black materials right there because they collect fingerprints and also scratches. Well, maybe you should just leave it then and always clean it. Then it looks also fancy. And I think they have found a very cool way here for this matte aluminum style. Also, just listen to it. Very haptical, interesting also. Um, the experience. Everything is streamlined. It has some Porsche style definitely with this strong wrapping right there. Then again this compact steering wheel, good control. And the base setup will be analog instruments on the left. Optional you can see here 12.3 inch digital cockpit. Soon more deals to that. The base setup here would be 8 inch in the top and this one the lower 8.6 inch always stays the same. And then optional, as we show you right here, 10.1 inch together with the MMI Navigation Plus that you get all the fancy, for example, also the satellite view. We'll soon dig deeper into the details of those screens right there. 
but let's just finish the base one here again with the single frame grill style I think again picking up the exterior details and then the lower part with the big classic middle console here by the way with the S-Tronic automatic transmission so this is then a dual clutch transmission and in the lower part you just don't have so many buttons anymore start stop and then a camera button for example to check out this really superb camera system with a great resolution and then just a volume button left that you can still menu control at. Digital instruments right there. I think they are best in class at the moment. You can also check out how fancy this full view of the map looks like but you can also get other information in there for example and also um, you know radio info, consumption info and so on. You're pretty flexible and uh, it definitely has a wow effect but you can still get those analog instruments if you like. And you can control those digital instruments on the left side. You zoom in and out on the map, for example, change the view or go back or then change in the menu right there. And this is a clear view of the head-up display. It can also show more information as I've already shown you with this nighttime feature. Infotainment details. Um, interesting is that when you swipe in this menu and you press a button, for example, you also get a clicking sound and somewhat a haptical feedback, although it's just a screen. It looks great in this glass view and look how fast it is with this new CPU Unix they are, uh, they are using. So pretty impressive for sure. And when you want to enter an address, then you can also play together with the lower screen because then you can um, either use the voice input, for example, but you can also um, um, you know, put, the, put just the letters right there or then use a writing function um, this is actually quite handy mm -hmm. when you then can enter it in this way. Other than that, both screens are a little bit separated. For example, here in the top, you can also change the settings and the radio and also get the um, Apple CarPlay connection, for example, or you can still remain with your classic Bluetooth connection. And one very interesting feature of this camera, I want to show you the 3D view. This is um, an, you know, an imaginary picture of all the surround cameras. This one then is just, you know, um, a 3D projection basically, but from all those pictures of the cameras, an uh, image is being formed. And then you can, for example, check, oh, am I really damaging my alloys right and left? This is, of course, a very, very impressive thing. Wow, this is really wow, wow, wow. But you have to take some time to control all of this, so you shouldn't do that while driving faster. <laughs> And taking a look at the lower screen in detail, here you can control the climate ones. Um, I still prefer to have real knobs because, I mean, it's super fancy. Also gives you this haptical feedback. It looks superb. You can control where the vents are coming from right there. But while driving, it is definitely distracting. You cannot control it while driving without being distracted. And I think that's really dangerous. In the lower part, you also have a drive select, for example, to pick the you know, dynamic and sport mode and something like that. Um, soon more to that while we drive the car. Again, it looks great. I have great ideas here, but you know, while yeah. driving, I think you yeah. need some you know, voice control or something. And um, I haven't managed to control the vent structure here, for example, where it's coming from via voice control. However, what you can do with the voice control to make it a little bit simpler and safer is, for example, adjust the temperature. So now says, what can I do for you? Change the temperature to 23 degrees. I'll increase the temperature to 23 degrees. Nice. So it's also 23 degrees now. Or you can also, for example, say, I am cold. What temperature should I set for you? 19 degrees. I'll lower the temperature to 19 degrees. Actually, the car should have said now, wait a minute, you first say I'm cold and then 19 degrees, I won't do that. <laughs> that would be, you know, appropriate answer of the vehicle. Um, but, you know, with changing the vent, for example, I've tried it, I can try it once more. Please change the vent. Could I'll... you say that? Okay. You can operate. That's not really a... Uh... I'll be... Oh. Whoa. So, I mean, in some of the situations, you're really like a little bit overwhelmed. Then some, you know, some features are popping up, but you know, the ones that are really working properly, that is then totally fine. So I think it's already a step in the um, right direction. 
we have to see how that one plays out. Of course, it also helps really when um, you know searching for a destination or something. Drive me to Berlin. I'm looking for destinations for you. Please wait a moment. Yeah, so Please now hello. Berlin appears here and I can just click it and go there. So that's also comes really handy. Adaptive cup holders in the front here, very well done. I like those, those are my favorite bags here basically. Then the room to put your key. Then electric handbrake here, very sleek design as well. Then this armrest, you can slide it forward a little bit, fixedly attached, superb build quality, the best you can find. And then you can flip it up and have two more USB supplies. Inductive charging platform, again, this almost nothing comes with standard equipment, you have to pay that extra. And of course, you can also put your phone right there. It um, does fit also. Sitting in the rear, yes, you have one centimeter longer leg room than in the previous generation. So it's a little bit more spacious. And you also have enough knee room here, even if the tall driver is sitting in the front. However, with those big luxury sedans, you always have the problem that the package, so considering the length on the exterior and the room you get on the interior, is really, really bad. So you, they are not using the length they have but you still have enough room because the car is so super long. Headroom wise is also totally fine. Good result also better as for the A7 because there the roof line falls a little bit more. And when you go for the estate version of the A6, it goes all the way like this. So you have more room than for your head, but this one here is actually really enough already. You feel a little bit cramped as you are in this lying seating position you also cannot really change the position so i can just stress again um, for me the times of the luxury sedans are over for uh, rear seat chauffeuring yes they look very classy on the exterior i have this classic approach but if you want the most um, you know luxury experience in the rear rather go for an suv because then you have an upright seating position also in the rear and you can flip those seats from here takes a little bit of effort. This is a one third, two third split from the general setup here. Um, when you lift the head restraints, you can also get the rear bench here a little bit flatter like this, that you have a transition. And you also have an armrest right there, like this with cup holders, adaptive, and some room right there. And then you can also just flip the middle part as a ski hatch and load through a lot of things. And then you can get two USB supplies for the rear, the 12 volt power supply, and optional is four zone climate control where you can control the temperature in the rear, even with the haptic feedback and the clicking sound. So um, this is really nicely done, but of course, again, a costly extra. So let's open this trunk hatch and it opens basically automatically, but it's not an electric system. So you have to close it quite firmly that it really closes. So, and then you have 530 liters, quite square dimensions for a luxury sedan. Um, so it is somehow very well used, but of course the building form itself is limiting very much. So the estate is the way to go then if you want it more versatile. A net can be equipped right there to keep things held tight. And with that, you have some sound equipment, great sound by the way from this optional sound system. Then when you put a cabin trolley inside, that you can check the dimensions. It's really long, that's for sure, but the height is limited. And then let's flip those seats. Let's check how that one plays out. This one then is the one third. You can, as I said earlier, also have just this ski hatch in the middle here. Hey guys. And then finally, the last one, and this one then is the maximum setup you have. Here on the left side, by the way, we push all the way down. And this is the difference when those head restraints are not put higher. Let's start the driving part, aka Thomas's driving lounge. And interesting, we have the dynamic all-wheel steering here. That means the tires on the rear axle can also move. And when we are going slowly, especially up to 5% across, you can really see it at the rear tire there, how they move a little bit left or a little bit right. It's really interesting to see and accounts for minus 1.1 meter turning circle of this vehicle when you're driving slowly and also the car feels more agile especially when driving at slower speeds when you are at higher speeds then it's not about the 
turning agility, it's more about the stability and that is then up to 2% in the same direction steering like the front wheels. That's the difference. And so it is a cost, a costful option but it is one that you should be going for if you have enough money and if you want to have an option which you know really gives you some technology advantage because it makes the car indeed feel more agile um, also when I'm turning it out in those very tight corners which is really fun to do although the car is big so usually I would say you know a car of that size is um, you know at some point on some tight roads not so much fun to drive but this all-wheel steering really accounts for it that you know it fakes a shorter wheelbase this is the, the driving feeling you get from this then so this is pretty cool as I said earlier we also have the adaptive air suspension built in here it is you know when you want to save money you can stay with the base suspension it will do fine uh, but if you're wow cool this is a great view here on the river Douro that ultimately ends in Porto in Portugal so if you have the money you should get the air suspension because it gives you this flying carpet riding comfort um, also the non-air suspensions are really good at Audi so you shouldn't be afraid to get also the base one but then again if you have a good budget for that leasing or buying wise the air suspension will give you more comfort and also more flexibility because at lower speeds I can you know have the best comfort it really feels like the car would be literally flying on the road this is pretty cool and at higher speeds then I can still get some more stability because I can also pick it in the drive select um, you know I can remain in auto mode dynamic mode comfort efficiency or individual and I can also race or lower the car so if I'm facing some bumps or maybe going slightly off-road I can put the car a little bit higher and that's pretty cool in the auto mode the car decides itself what it's going to do with the dual clutch transmission automatic gearbox you can always use the shifting pedals here it goes into manual mode you can shift up again or hold the pedal to go back to the D mode besides the driving modes you can also pull on the shifting lever then you get in this S mode but this just for shifting the gears are turned up higher shifting later and shifting down earlier again this is automatically happening when you go to the dynamic mode of the vehicle and I can do it right now as well so when I'm in this dynamic mode I can also see that the suspension is going down I have more contact to the road car feels stiffer the steering gets a little bit more precise and you know a little bit more resistance from it and the gears are then automatically in this S mode and it gets some more boost from the engine then as well so um, that air suspension really makes you very flexible and for example the sport mode is good that you can do some overtaking maneuver here quite quickly thank you so much that was really nice so you can get more power from that engine without you know shifting down but then again you can also just stay in the normal driving mode and use the pedals right there and here again those corners are actually for a big luxury sedan rather tight but then again this great suspension together with a progressive steering they've worked on this was one of the factors they've improved now um, so you see I can keep my hands on the steering wheel all the time I don't have to steer much so the angle of the corner is pretty much like the angle of the steering wheel and that to me is one of the most important factors when driving the car and that is one thing um, I feel sometimes it is lacking especially in base Mercedes models if you compare them to, to that um, maybe it gives you a little bit more natural steering wheel feeling because some criticize with Audi that it would be too artificial um, but then again at Mercedes you have to steer much more so with the base Mercedes E-Class for example I wouldn't really have fun here in those corners um, I would have to steer you know maybe this angle more each corner to the to the right and the left 
Um, with the BMW, they have something in between. They give you a very natural steering feeling, but you don't have to turn that much um, like with Mercedes. So it's really like, you know, from, from step to step, how those three premium manufacturers behave also in steering wise. It's also a very interesting finding when you really drive all three direct competitors. So let's see if we can overtake this truck then in front of us. And this also accounts for the feeling that this cuff doesn't feel too big. It is really big, but for example, also the E-Class and the BMW 5 Series, they feel bigger when driving. I mean, they use um, a lot of aluminum here also to keep the, um, uh, the weight down. Here we go. And how effortless this vehicle does that. Wow, that's really cool. Here also in the corner, good contact to the road again, good feedback from the car. So um, aluminum, for example, used at the hood, at the doors to keep the weight down. But nowadays, you know, BMW 7 Series and 5 Series, they introduced this um, uh, also a lot of, you know, aluminum loose used the 7 Series, even carbon fiber. So they, you know, a lot of years, Audi was the only aluminum low weight car in this segment. Um, now others have catch up there as well. So yes, it is a relaxed feeling and it is also a sporty feeling and we're not in the you know, S8, S6 or something. Um, so this is still somewhat the base model with this petrol engine and I don't have the feeling it should be any, you know, any sportier. So with, for example, the Mercedes E-Class, you have the base E-Class, which is pretty, you know, lax, luxury-wise, so um, not sporty at all. And then you got to get an E43 to get it sporty. And with BMW and Audi both, they are also the base models uh, drive pretty funny and, and, and sporty. Well, they don't drive funny, they drive in a fun way or in a fun sport, fun sporty way. That's more precise. So that's about you know steering the uh, the car yourself. However, if you think about upper midsize segment, which is this one here, and midsize segment, which would be a four C class uh, and uh, BMW three series, those midsize cars, of course, give you more driving fun because they do feel lighter. So at some point, you, whoa, that's a bump. <laughs> But for such a fierce bump, the suspension still handled that very well, I have to say. Um, so if you go for the mid-size segment, you have more driving fun, the car feels lighter, you can't deny physics, then at some point this weight does play a role for sure. And you know, getting back to the aspect when I want to change the temperature, yeah, I can, some, but I always have to look, you know, or you have to do trial and error. So. Temperature you can set with the voice command, but sometimes I don't feel like talking to the car all the time. Maybe if I enter a destination mode, like you know, drive me to Barcelona or whatever. But then hmm, I'm somehow missing those those turning knobs, you know. Or maybe you know it has to be somewhere where you can uh, click it a little bit easier. Then so that's one one downside of this infotainment uh, system for sure. Other than that, you can also at daytime very clearly read what's happening in those. Uh, you know, on those three displays, that's pretty cool. And again, um, I'm you know driving those bending corners here all the time, and I'm not getting any fatigue. For example, um, and sometimes with bigger cars, you say, you know, great luxury, awesome vehicle, but mm, getting a little bit too stressful in, in winding corners. And here it's actually no problem. Those 20-inch rims, by the way get some more comfort if you go a little bit smaller. They're still somewhat okay, especially in combination with the air suspension. But if you do not pick the air suspension, do yourself the favor and get some more comfort by not going 20 inch rims. Um, maybe go, you know, 17 could look a little bit small for people who really love to check the, you know, the relation of rims and cars. 18 or 19 would be my tip for you to go for. That's, uh, I think, a good compromise between looks and then also the, the driving comfort because the bigger the rim, the less the comfort, the, the more the sporty feeling, yes, but uh, the bumps are more transported than to the, uh, to the car because you have less uh, tire area left. So I think driving-wise from the whole setup, they 
they've done a really great job. So as for consumption, you know, as I told you earlier, they are all using this mild hybrid technology. So when I'm, for example, going to this efficiency mode, I'm boosting that even more. So um, for example, now when I'm uh, going off the throttle and um, the car is just rolling, then, you know, there's hardly any resistance for the engine. The rolling effect of the car is being used. And depending on, you know, let's see if it's maybe also has to do with the AC. Sometimes it can be, you know, depending on how much consumers you have in the car, like those electric consumers. So, um, for example, yesterday I was also on the motorway and then I was seeing how the RPMs dropped to zero, especially in the efficiency mode. And then the car was really fully sailing and uh, basically using, not using any fuel. And so, on motorway with constant speed and stuff, I could get this car to about nine liters on 100 kilometers. And that is actually pretty decent consumption for such a big vehicle. Of, your, of course, you can um, get that higher when you have this agile ride, for example. Uh, here now, you know, in those bending corners, acceleration, braking, acceleration, braking. We are here, here about 13 and a half liters on 100 kilometers. Uh, for the MPG, just Google 13 liter or 13 L slash 100 km in MPG for the you know the performance consumption and for the minimum consumption then 9 L slash 100 km in MPG. So yes, you can drive it fuel consuming but then you can you see uh, when you push it hmm, it goes really uh, way up high and so the, the sailing coasting function with the 48 volt board net mild hybrid technology is something that works when you really plan it and use it in the most efficient way and uh, on paper in, in the laboratory basically and on the motorway that is then somehow working but other than that um, yeah you know not really always those cobblestones area here wow the air suspension is also evening that out very very well that's that's pretty fancy really cool so the, the good thing to me is that you can still drive this car on your own it's not only um, an autonomous driving machine although it is surely capable of doing so. Um, you know, we have the autonomous emergency brake, which is starting from standard equipment, most important feature. Then optional blind spot monitor. This area here is flashing when someone is overtaking you. This is the most important assistance system option. Third most important is the adaptive cruise control which is really giving you a comfort feature. Also now in different trims available, they put it together in some assistance systems packages. And then you can get this, for example, a tour package and so on. And the ACC also available then with a traffic jam assistant that you can basically let the car drive and don't do anything yourself at very low speeds. That's very comfortable. And then everything else is of course nice to have let's take it that way uh, in corners like those here where you have a lot of fun driving you don't want um, too much to do with it but when you're on the motorway for example that's pretty cool when you can also have this steering assist the car could theoretically drive on its own but after a while it says please put your hands on the steering wheel but you can feel definitely that the car is steering yourself and I found this system a better approach than Mercedes does because with Mercedes we recently experienced in the A-Class and in the G-Class that those corrections when you were going you know closer to the lines were done by the brakes and then you're suddenly like bam not with the steering wheel but just oh my god you everyone is now shaking in the car because the car is then reducing speed at the inside wheels to get the car off on the road again here it's just slightly done with the steering correction by the car itself. That's a smoother transition. However, I always turn it off here with the button, with this column here. I always turn it off basically uh, when I want to steer myself.
because you get a very loose steering feel when you have it activated and you're still you know, steering actively yourself. It's good when you want to relax on the motorway, keep your hands on the steering wheel and then let the car basically do its own job with you a little bit, you know, surveying it. And of course, we always have to have to be aware of uh, uh, what's really happening. But pretty impressive, uh, definitely how all the systems are working. All the radar systems that are built in here in the car, in this car, and also safety-wise, and that you get then also the warning when you set the turning indicator and want to overtake. For example, the 3D camera systems we've shown you earlier um, and stuff. So that's um, you know that, that's also putting input then in this CPU unit called ZFAS, developed by Nvidia, and. It's really a driving computer, basically, this car. Of course, at some point you can say over-engineered, but as I've driven the A8, the A7 and the A6 now, you're getting used to it a little bit. So as I was first driving the A8, and for the very first time, then I was like, oh, wow, that's really it's too much, too much at once. But then you're getting used, it, used to it, and then it's also, you know, quite okay. But then again, you also do not have to order every option they have available because this is also one of the biggest downside of this car it can get so extremely expensive and the extra price policy is sometimes yeah i will really have to say pathetic because you have to pay for everything extra and sometimes also extremely high prices just for some very very small things so maybe if they they are a little bit more successful they could also get give something back to the customer there and include some more features then as an advantage. I think a lot of people would be um, glad for that and maybe also honor that then. So I'm still not getting you know any, any fatigue here. That's pretty cool. So also long-term comfort with those sport seats are given. By the way, I said earlier, base seat, sport seat, super sport seat, multi-contour seat. The super sport seat is not out yet, it will come later and then you all see the different differentiation to this normal sport seat here and the super sport seat that it has the integrated head restraint. This one here has a separated head restraint but I recommend you to stick with those sport seats here because the super sport seats will uh, have you know less room to move around and you will not use this car on the racetrack. So this sport seat here gives you a good compromise between a little bit more shoulder support. So here I'm being kept tight in those corners don't slide around too much also good that I have the Alcantara if you would here then again have the full animal skin seat I would slide around all the time that's also one thing you have to um, keep in mind even if you don't care about the animals it's better to be kept tight a little bit more in the seat especially um, you know in those in those um, bending turns so overall I think also satisfied with those sport seats Mm, at some point I would of course be interested also in the base seats. I'm always very interested in how cars really look like in the base variant. Unfortunately we do not always have the chance to do so because the manufacturers always want to present you know, everything they have that no journalist later says, wait a minute, that entertainment system is too small. Yeah, because maybe there's a bigger one optional. So they put everything they have in there that no one can complain. And so I also can have a very differentiated opinion about those uh, manual seats. As I said earlier, I like it when not everything is electric. However, electric seats, I found them quite cool. But then the important information is they are not missing in this vehicle. It's just an option, again, to have electric seats. And you just have to know that and then decide if it's really important to you, if you want to pay that money for, for this kind of stuff. Yeah, so pretty impressive and I think the driving part is definitely the one where this car here can score one of the best results, you know, besides the consumption again, but that's also pretty common in, in the segment here. However, I'm really astonished that the difference between, you know, the minimum and the maximum consumption is really high for though that's quite often with very small turbo engines but I'm, I'm, I'm really um, 
surprised that we also have that here with a with a very big vehicle with big displacement still three liter v6 usually they are not that sensitive in the differentiation um, or in, in, in the difference between the, the minimum and the maximum consumption so again nine liters minimum 13 something more maximum and the realistic everyday driving figure will usually be then somewhere in between so around 11 which then would be somewhat okay and then the question if if that one justifies the extra price for the diesel um, that really depends on how many kilometers a year you are driving and of course i want to show you some motorway driving at the moment i'm in the dynamic mode so i can also show you some more of the acceleration and also about cell insulation and some of the assistant systems so let's go down here soon there will also be more speed allowed as soon as we approach the next one here i can also activate the adaptive cruise control the distance to the car in front of me is being kept as you can see the car is breaking uh, breaking not breaking down <laughs> and also reacting on the speed limits so now it was 40 kilometers an hour and the adaptive cruise control reads the traffic signs you can get this trim of the acc but you do not have to so you can pick that one but if you have it then it's always there and now let's accelerate let's do some uh, let's do some 70 to 120 kilometers was already 125 so you can see really good performance here from the 3 liter v6 the sound is not too loud so it's rather subtle and I mean if you're driving a6 you also do not want to show off so I, I think that's also a perfectly fine decision wise then so now the cruise control you can set it here at the column next to the steering wheel and I also have possibility then to deactivate or activate the lane guidance so if I want to drive a little bit sporty or maybe just do the acceleration braking part with the ACC but steer my own that's fine but I can also activate it and then the car is really helping me to keep the lane so this is not a system where you should take your hands off the steering wheel just I'm demonstrating you that the car is being kept in the lane and that works very accurately. So um, now it's already warning me, please uh, take over the steering wheel. I get a small warning sign. So that, that goes quite quickly then that you have to take over. So usually you keep the steering wheel and now I get some help from the steering that I'm being kept in the lane. And as I said earlier, when I'm really actively steering myself, especially on winding motorway roads, it's somehow better to deactivate it if it's more running straight and it's getting rather boring then it can be also relaxing to have it activated but um, all of those systems are really really working uh, pretty flawlessly so that's, that's really cool sound insulation wise you hear nothing so the sound insulation is definitely on a top-notch level there is this optional sound insulation package so the base one is already good then you can always put it on the next level and even increase the noise insulation which is the case with this vehicle here and when you're driving about 120 kilometers an hour so over 60 miles an hour 60 60 70 miles an hour you hear nothing it would be almost like standing still so the only wind sounds you probably hear is when you have turned the ac up in a you know level four vent or level five or something but that's basically it and this is uh, definitely very impressive. However, all of the competitors, they managed to do that very well. I think Mercedes with the E-Class is at the moment leading in the respect of the noise insulation. So the E-Class to me was the most silent one. And sound system wise, this Bang & Olufsen sound system here, I've seen it earlier with this pretty spectacular popping up effect when the speaker in the front there goes up. It's really a very decent sound. 
I think the um, 3D surround in the Mercedes E-Class is in this case also a little notch better. So it's really interesting how of those three premium manufacturers I've mentioned so many different elements now. You know, in this field Audi is a little bit better, in that field Mercedes is a little bit better, in that field BMW is a little bit better and it, it's really more about which one of those special features is the most important to you and then it could be your final choice choice of you know which which one to go for the, for those so pretty relaxing ride here on the motorway definitely a great autobahn vehicle and if you're driving the estate or the sedan it will not matter really very much driving wise of course at a later stage we'll also take another in-depth look at the estate which is especially popular in Germany because Germans like to load stuff then in those uh, estate wagon trunks and right there and yeah I have to say you know you always have the possibility to throw a bicycle in there which is not possible in the sedan here but driving wise there's usually not much of a difference you know how, the, how they really behave or if they're sport here or something weight wise it's also not much of a difference so um, that's usually the same then so I can really enjoy this autobahn ride and this car is basically autonomous ready but the regulations have to come first for that and we've also seen recently that there are also some accidents when people trust too much in autonomous drive systems so I think uh, it will take some more years until we have this transition phase finished for that. So what do you think about this tech fest here today in the vehicle? And now to our conclusion for today with the all-new Audi A6. Well, if you compare it to the A7 and the A8, yes, the A7 is the sportier approach, the A8 is the long approach, the big luxury chauffeur approach. This one here, the very classic approach, as I've told you, and it is rather an evolution in design, so nothing super spectacular, but it is very sharply designed. And there will, of course, also be the estate if you want to have some more room on the interior. The interior is so precise, they have perfection in detail. The infotainment system, yeah, I think among the three German premium manufacturers, I think it is the best solution. However, you can always say that's maybe a little bit over-engineered and they have, you know, they have to try to find some more solutions that it's easier to control, although you have so many controls available. Also good that we have Alcantara seats available even here in the high luxury segment. Driving wise, it was very, very good. I can tell you um, daytime and nighttime. So this car here, already in the base version, really masters the compromise between sportiness and the luxury comfort very well. And to me, even a little bit more than its premium competitors. So overall, if you ask me, you know, the initial question, is it at the moment best in segment? I would say yes on a very high level because all three cars, the Mercedes E-Class and the BMW 5 Series and here the Audi A6, they are all really superb cars. Of course, the overall concept is rather conservative and old school, but if you compare them then on a very high level, I think now with the new generation here, Audi leads it by a little bit in those different chapters I have presented to you. Or what do you think after watching all three of our reviews? You know, we also have a couple of videos from the BMW 5 Series and the Mercedes E-Class in different version. Make sure to check them out as well and also see you next time at Autogefühl.